Hey guys, so this video is going to take the place of me physically being there to give you notes and it's going to be a little bit different to what you are accustomed to. You are going to need to have a pen or pencil and then the note sheet that has the exact same title as this PowerPoint presentation. All right, so this note sheet, pen and pencil, get it, let's go. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit different than what you're used to, like I said before. What you want to pay attention to is anything that's underlined, because that's going to be the words that you are writing down. So let's start with a little bit of introductory information. So we classify pollen as trace evidence, because it's really, really tiny, and it's specifically trace evidence that comes from plants. We can use it to figure out location of a crime scene, or the location in which a body was moved from or moved to, and we can also use it to pinpoint the time of year or season during which a crime took place. The study of pollen and spore evidence is known as forensic paleontology, so it's just how we take that normal biological topic of pollen and spores and we relate it back to crimes. And uh, you do need to know that pollen and spores are both reproductive structures of plants. So they're, they, they are there to aid plants in their ability to make babies, pretty much. Okay, so let's just understand right off the bat that not every plant is going to produce pollen. Some plants produce pollen and some plants produce spores. But by understanding the production pattern for both of these things, we can pretty much predict what's called a pollen fingerprint. And then we can use that pollen fingerprint to help us to map out or pinpoint the location of a crime scene or the location of where a body has been or was moved to. So the definition of a pollen fingerprint, so again, you're, on, you're writing what's underlined, is going to be the number and type of pollen grains that are found in a geographic area at a special time of year or a particular time of year. So literally you're going to take a sample of all the pollen available to you. You're going to se separate them all out based on type and we do that based on shape and appearance. So like these pictures that you can see here all show different kinds of pollen grains and then we'll count how many of the different kinds we see and that tells us in this area this is the kind of pollen that's normally produced at this type of year. So like I said before, not all plants are going to make pollen. We have two major categories of plants, or modern day plants if you'd like to think of them that way, and they're called gymnosperms and angiosperms. So the difference is one set produces pollen and the other does not. Your gymnosperms are going to be plants that do not have seeds in their fruit and they don't make flowers. So think of any kind of tree that you see around Christmas time. So Christmas trees or fir trees or any tree that makes a pine cone. Angiosperms on the other hand do keep their seeds and fruit and they make flowers so they produce pollen. So any kind of plant that makes a flower, so a rose bush or even the, like the dandelions in your um, in your yard, all of those things would produce pollen. And the whole reason that pollen exists from a biological perspective is to be able to distribute or disperse the male gametes or the male sex cells. Alright, so let's look at them in a little bit more depth. So the word gymno means naked and sperm refers to seed. So literally the word gymnosperm means naked seed. Now, like I said before, your gymnosperms are going to produce cones. They don't make fruit. And inside of their cones, that's where you find their seeds. And we actually have trees that make male cones and some trees that make female cones. And we also have trees that make both male and female cones all on the same tree. Pollination is going to take place wherever that pollen grain germinates and makes a sperm cell, which is going to fertilize the female cone's eggs and actually allow that plant to make more of itself. So these images that you're seeing here, the bigger of the two is normally the female cones, and then the skinnier of the two, like this one here and this one here, those tend to be the male versions of pine cones. Okay, angiosperms on the other hand 
are plants that are capable of making flowers and the flower itself is going to be the main reproductive structure in that particular type of plant. Now, flowers can be male or female or a lot of them are actually what we consider hermaphrodite where you have both male structures and female structures all on the same flower. But for hermaphrodite flowers, we have sections that are male and sections that are female. You can think about it that way. So the female part of your plant is called the pistil. It's this entire section that I am drawing my laser around here. Let's do this. So that whole piece, that's going to be your female section of the flower. That's called the pistil. And down at the base is where it produces its egg cells or its ovules is the biology word that we use. So these things right here, those are going to be your eggs or your ovules. And the male part of the flower is called the stamen. And that would be this section here and this section here. And that's where pollen is made. So we're going to talk through pollination just a little bit. Pollination is going to be the transfer or the movement of pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. And there are two types of pollination. There's self-pollination, where it's occurring on the exact same flower. And then there's cross-pollination, where it's occurring on two separate flowers. So think of self-pollination as we're moving pollen from the male part of flower A to the female part of flower A and think of cross-pollination as we are moving pollen from the male part of flower A to the female part of flower B. So two separate flowers versus the exact same flower. Now, it's possible for plants to do both forms, like no one plant prefers one form or the other, because pollination is normally helped. It's either done by animals or by wind or water. It's not just the flower itself that's in charge of moving its own pollen grains. Okay, so some types of plants don't produce pollen, instead they produce spores. And we normally consider these types of plants primitive plants because they haven't evolved to the point where they're making pollen grains. Now, spore production and how we use spores in forensics is very similar to pollen production and how we use pollen in forensics. So just like how we have a pollen profile, we can do the exact same thing with spores. It's called a spore profile or a spore fingerprint. And all we're doing is we're going to gather up all the different kinds of spores that we can find and we're gonna separate them by type and then count how many we find of each kind. And we do that in a geographical area. So for example, I can gather all the spores that I find in the general area of Mesquite High School and I can figure out what my fingerprint looks like for this section of Mesquite based on this time of year. So examples of some things that produce spores are algae and some types of fern like these pictures that you're seeing here. This is a fern, like you might have noticed that when you flip fern leaves over there, these little brown sacks, that's where the spores are held until it's time for the plant to get rid of them, for them to move on and, and make more plants. Um, algae specifically produces spores that can be dispersed not just by wind, but also by water. And uh, things like yeast, like the stuff that you use when you're making bread, or mushrooms, which are both fungi, by the way, they also produce spores. But the majority of your spores are going to be moved around by wind. With, pollinate, with pollen producers, a lot of the pollen gets moved around by animals of some sort, but with spore producers, a lot of it gets moved around by wind. Okay, so like I was saying, uh, most spores are carried by wind or water, mostly wind. Some types of spore producers will push the spores out into the air, and that's what this picture is showing you, like all this little white stuff that looks almost like dust or smoke, that's actually spores. And then animals are also capable of carrying spores. So how spores are used in crime solving has a lot to do with the fact that they're pretty unique structures. So very few spores and pollen grains look the same and they're what we call species specific. So a certain kind of plant makes a certain kind of pollen grain or a certain kind of spore. You don't find lots of plants making the same exact type of pollen grain or this, the same exact type of spore. So they're unique and they're species specific 
and it's very it's a very diverse structure that is also pretty sturdy it's pretty hard and it's it's difficult to destroy and because they're so small it's also difficult to get rid of even though you think you've cleaned up the area really well or you swept off the area really well it's all very often possible that we can still find tiny examples of the pollen from a specific kind of plant this comes in really handy when we're looking at things like marijuana and drug busts so really quick let's talk about some of the general structure the outer layer of a pollen grain or a spore is called the exine and it normally has some very specific or unique and complex structure that you can look at under a microscope so if you think back to one of those pictures at the beginning where you saw all the different colors and the different shapes, none of them looked the same because they're all specific to the, that type of plant that's making them. The size and the shape and the thickness and the surface features can tell the scientists looking at these structures a lot of information about the pollen grains themselves and how they could potentially travel and what organisms could have made them, so what types of plants would have made them. Once we've figured out what kind of plant we're working with or what type of pollen spores we're working with, we can then narrow down where those plants are located. So where could this type of pollen grain or spore have come from? We can then also figure out what type of trees and other vegetation would be in that area. And then if it's been on the body or not on, or on the clothing, we can also figure out if that body has been moved since its time of death or was that place where it was found, the original crime scene. So because they're so tiny and because they're so microscopic, like I said, it is very difficult to get rid of them. And that's true for both like the physical location of the crime scene, but also on the victim. It gets caught in your hair, on your skin, in your nostrils, in your ear, inside the folds of your clothing. Like it's very, very easy for them to get, to become a part of a crime scene. Um, when these structures are collected, it needs to be done really, really carefully to make sure that contamination doesn't take place, especially contamination from one kind of pollen grain or spore to another type of pollen grain or spore. You don't want to ever mix them up. Okay, so all of these are some common places that pollen and spores are found. As you can see, there's a, lot, it's a large list of things. And it's, again, it's easy for this particular structure to just become a part of a crime scene or to be found on or even inside of a victim or other structures. Right, in terms of analysis, it's pretty easy to analyze these guys. They are microscopic, so most of the analysis happens using a microscope, but we Particularly, we'll use either a transition microscope or a phase contrast microscope that allows us to see some more features or some, some specific shapes and colors and patterns within the spore or the pollen grain itself. Okay, so that's it for notes. You are now going to use these very same notes you just took to answer the front and back sheet that's titled Pollen and Spores. So it's just a way for you to review your information one more time. Um, you need to go ahead and expect a vocabulary test. I'm going to go ahead and couple that with the soil vocabulary words, and you'll have a test over both of those when I get back, so next week pretty much. And then once you're done with this, there's one more thing for you to work on. All of the instructions are written out for you. Read them, and you should be fine. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.